This is a podcast about one woman's mission to help entrepreneurs and business owners write better business books. Each week, we tackle your writing excuses, because there are excuses too, and help you beat the blank page of doom so that you can write the book that will grow your life and your business. Now, here's your host, Vicky Fraser. Hello, and welcome to The 1000 Authors Show. I'm Vicky Fraser, and this is my husband, Joe. Hello. Hello. And for the first time in quite a long time, I think this episode is actually going out on Halloween. Blimey. I know, which is why you might have noticed that there is a cat in the background. Cat. This is our concession. We would have been a little bit more organised and, you know, done something really cool with costumes and stuff if we'd been a little bit more organised. We're not that organised. But right now, we are... We've had a busy couple of weeks, haven't we? And we've we've just not been able to do anything except Halloween cat, really. Yeah. So, anyway, um, today well, we, we're not drinking anything today. It's just a shambles. It's a shambles, and we'll explain why in just a moment. We do have a good excuse, fairly good excuse. Do you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, what are we reading, Joe? What are you reading? Um, I've just finished "Don't Touch My Hair" by Emma Debiri. Did you enjoy it? I did enjoy it. I did enjoy it. Learned lots of things. What did you learn? Don't touch people's hair. Um, no, I learned a lot about um, the the meaning and the structures behind black people's hair and the symbolism it has primarily for, well, not primarily, but for white people and black people. Um, lots of good stuff. Really interesting. Mm. Lots of history. Really, really interesting. It was in, really fascinating, wasn't it, to read a history of the world and... Africa pre-colonialism and colonialism through the lens of hair. Mm. It was a really interesting, t- a fascinating take on the subject. And I just, I loved everything about it. I'm a proper Emma de Beery fangirl now. There, there were sections of it where there were paragraphs I did not understand. It was oh. like, like, there was like sort of three quarters of the way through, yeah. there was a very dense section that felt like an academic paper that I was not prepared for. Yeah, she. I mean, she is an academic. Um, mm. I thought that like ninety five percent of it was really well done, though, and simplified down to kind of lay people terms. And yeah. but yeah, I had I had trouble with it a few bits as well because I'm not an anthropologist. So yeah. Um, but yeah, it was. I, I just love that book. I'm proper proper fan girl. <laughs> Noodle is pressing his face up against the window of my office, yowling to come in, despite the fact that he went out less than five minutes ago. Yeah. He can stay out now. I think you can. Because um, I've just mopped my floor. So I am reading fiction. What what I'm fiction. What I am reading is um, the bus driver who wanted to be God by Edgar Kerrett, um, and that is a book of short stories which you read a couple of weeks ago. Yes, I enjoyed very much. Um, I enjoyed the short stories more than I enjoyed the slightly less short story which comprised half the book. Okay, well, I haven't got that far yet because mm. I've just read the bus driver who wanted to be God, and I loved it. I loved that. It was just yes, it was. It was just beautifully done. Mm. Yeah, I will talk more about that when I've finished it because I have re- read the first two. Okay. Uh, non-fiction, I am still reading Read Books All Day and Get Paid For It by Jenny Nash, which is great. It's all about uh, running a book coaching business, which is what I do. Blimey. I know. Um, it's really great and it's really helping me prepare for the new coaching that I'm about to start with my new business coach, oh. um, Hilary Weiss. Hi, Hilary. Hi, Hilary. <laughs> I'm really excited about it. Um, and I'm also reading Some Kids I Taught and What They Taught Me by Kate Clancy, which is Oh my gosh, I love it so much, and um, that's going to be the book that I'm going to make you read next. Um, no, you'll love it. Really? You will love it, yeah. Well, I like um, to read books that I want to read. Or do I just, you are reading just... books you want to read as well. I'm reading books you want me to read. You've read one book I want you to read. <laughs> <laughs> one. And you still just, haven't read Invisible Women. I quite like Space Pirates, though. That's the thing. You can do both. Mm. I'm doing both. Anyway, I think you'll really love that. Okay. Yeah. Um... Right, so that's all. And also, I bought this beautiful new book the other day. If you're watching the video, you can you can see it. And this is thanks Sarah Silver for pointing me in this direction. And then I went and bought the hardback because it's so pretty. <laughs> um, and it's called The Cabinet of Linguistic Curiosities, a yearbook of forgotten words. And so for each day of the year, there's a new word. Mm-hmm. Today's word is... Today's word is xenotransplantation. Noun. The transplantation of non-human material into a human patient. So like roots and potatoes. What? And trills. Anyway. I'm not sure that's what it meant. 
Um, no, it doesn't. <laughs> so the, the term was coined in 1968 um, to describe transplants. So, for example, um, in 1984, a girl named Stephanie was um, she had a heart defect and got a heart transplant, and I believe it was a a baby baboon, a donor Ooh. heart from a baboon. <laughs> and I know that people have had pig hearts, mm-hmm. pig valves, pig valves, things like that. So that was you know transplantation. And it comes from, the words both come from the same Greek root. So xenos means stranger, as in words like xenon and xenophobia and that kind of thing. Um, and xenograft was the earlier word. And that, that also came from, um, from a, Greek, a Greek word as well. So there you go. Nice. Stranger. Word of the day. Yeah, word of the day. So we should be doing more of these. Okay. So you'll have that to look forward to or, you know, just skip past. <laughs> Um, okay, and right, okay, the reason that we are so disorganised is that we've had builders in for the last two weeks. Yes. We now have new windows. We also have some holes. We have three new windows and one big hole. Big hole. Um, which is being filled this week by another new window. And it, oh my goodness, the windows are beautiful. Mm. Oaky, They're so beautiful. Oaky goodness. Solid oak, double glazed. They actually open. This is very exciting. Amazing. It's yeah. like, it's like, oof. There's going to be a new blog up on Project Dingle, hopefully by the time you read this, projectdingle.co.uk, if mm-hmm. you want to follow the progress of our windows and see a picture of the original 17th century window frame that we've just uncovered this afternoon. Mm. When I say we, I mean Ken and Phil. I Who are fitting our windows. Yes. So, um, so yeah, anyway, we are in week two of my editing series, and this is the final week of the editing series. Okay, that's a short series. It is. It's a... It's a, it's a by... Opic? No. No. <laughs> um, mm. Burr. It's a... It's a... There's a word for it, I'm sure. A two-part series. It's a two-parter. <laughs> we could just a two-part series. <clears throat> we should, yeah. Maybe edit some of that. Yeah. Maybe not. Okay. I don't... I think Podfly would just be like, no, they're idiots. They're going to stay in. I'm sure they wouldn't say that at all. Um, Hi, Podfly. Hi, Podfly, because <laughs> Podfly are lovely. Okay, so this is part two. Last week we did structural editing, which yes. is all about looking at the bigger picture, making sure that everything makes sense and is all kind of in the right place and more mm-hmm. or less More or less in the right order. More or less works. Um, this week we are going to look at copy editing and proofreading, which is basically how to edit the actual words and sentences that you've got. So I'm really good. I mean, you know, we could spend quite a long time on this. I've I've got a bunch of, um, a bunch of tips for for you to help you edit your own work. What is the difference between copy editing and proofreading? Oh, good question, Joe. Good question. The difference between copy editing and proofreading, right? Proofreading is really consistency, layout, spelling, grammar, sense, punctuation, that kind of thing. Okay. Um, and it's pretty much the last thing you do. Mm-hmm. Copy editing is much more in depth than proofreading. So it means revising the text to improve the flow, the structure, the rhythm, the feeling of what you're writing, all of that kind of thing. So it's, it's much more in depth than, than proofreading. Okay. So copy editing is, is like... Typos and things. No. No. Copy editing, copy editing is, is, is crafting your work and proofreading is like yeah. dotting the I's and making the commas in the right place. Yeah, pretty much. There's a, I mean, there's a bit of crossover between both of them, to be honest. Sure. But copy editing, you would not expect a proofreader to copy edit your work and really massively improve it. A copy editor will do a really good job of improving what you've written, improving the understanding, improving the feeling, um, just making it better, okay. making it making it read better, making it have more of an impact. So, okay, cool. Okay. So in this episode, we're, we're going to share some top tips to help you edit your own book. However, if your budget allows, I would always recommend getting a professional editor in to help you because we writers are just, no matter how much we try, we're just not very objective mm-hmm. about our own writing. It's really difficult to be. Um, and we don't always, we know what we mean. Mm. And so we don't always recognize when we haven't made ourselves clear or when we've come across maybe a bit abrupt or mm-hmm. maybe, you know, we think, oh, that sounds okay in your head. And then someone reads it, it's like, oh, that sounds kind of arrogant or you sound a bit weak there. Um, sure. So that that's where a real good copy editor will be able to come in and be like, we're going to make you sound confident instead of arrogant. And we're going to make you sound strong instead of a bit wishy-washy. Okay. 
So that's what you can do. So, but if you don't have the budget for a good copy editor, you can do a, a good job of this yourself. Um, but it is going to require you to be super honest with yourself and a little bit brutal mm -hmm. with your own writing. So um, if you're happy to do that, let's start. You ready? Yes. Okay. Okay, so here is a top tip. Um, this is a really good, really good way to find out if your book is any good. <laughs> uh, listen to what you've written. Have it read out. Did you know that you can get your computer to read to you? Can you? Yeah. You can. Um, I prefer, I like Kate on my Mac. So there's Kate and Daniel are the, the British uh, speakers. Um, Daniel, if I'm honest, sounds like a bit of an arse. He sounds a bit like a Tory. Um, and I much prefer Kate, who sounds a lot more friendly. Okay. So, um, but yeah, you can, you can use your computer to read your book to you. It's fairly simple to do on a Mac. I don't know how to do it on... Um, uh, PC, but I'm sure there is a way to do it. It'll be in the accessibility options somewhere. Yeah, yeah, we'll yeah. So it's certainly on the Mac. It's in the accessibility uh, options. The reason to do this is that hearing it spoken, hearing your words spoken, will make mistakes and clumsy writing really obvious. Mm -hmm. um, so do it. If you can persuade a loved one or a friend to read it for you, you could do that. But be aware that they might get halfway through and want to, you know. Not do that anymore. Not do that anymore. <laughs> so yeah, if you can stand the computer voice, the computer voice is a really good option. Okay. So that was my first tip, tip the first. Um, tip the second, I'm going to run out of, forget what numbers are mine. Remove or replace your crutch words. So for me, I overuse the word so as I just demonstrated. Okay. Drives me up the wall. Um, you can do a word frequency count, count in Scrivener and probably in other software as well to find out which words you use most often. Obviously, words like the and and are going to be up there at the top. But if you spot anything else that you overuse, I know some people overuse the word suddenly or obviously or literally. Mm -hmm. um, that can that 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 kind of search and replace thing will find them. Word frequency count can can really help with that. Uh, get rid of your exclamation marks. <laughs> this is one of my pet hates. And also, I think it was Terry Pratchett who said that multiple exclamation marks are a sign of an unsound mind. Mm. I, tend I think to so. Agree. I tend to agree. Yes. Um, yeah. Get rid of your exclamation marks and also check for any other problem punctuation. But you don't need exclamation marks in your writing. F. Scott Fitzgerald said an exclamation point is like laughing at your own joke. Kind of is. Mm-hmm. And also, if you're if you have written what you've written well enough, it should make its own point. It should be its own emphasis. You shouldn't need to. You shouldn't need to kind of nudge the reader. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Treat the reader like an intelligent person, even even if at the moment it seems it seems like all the evidence points to the contrary. Um, but treat the reader like an intelligent person. Don't over-explain. Don't over. You know. Mm -hmm. You don't need to because most people are, you know, reasonably intelligent. So. Um, what's my next tip? Use simpler words rather than obtuse ones so that you don't sound pretentious and so that you don't confuse people. Mm -hmm. Okay. Joe's really tired. I'm exhausted. Yeah. I've had a really long day. I got up very early. I drove a long way. I have been training people all day long and then I've driven home. And, and now, now here I am. He's doing a podcast. Looking a bit bewildered. Oh, but I really appreciate it. I'm sorry. It's okay. I just think that people like to listen to you more than they like to oh, listen to me. I don't think that's true. Well, you can read the next tip out. Nobody ever emails me to tell me that. Oh, they email me. I just don't tell you, you just because, don't tell me. because it upsets me, so Aww. I delete it. <laughs> that's not true. Harsh. Um, that's not true. So, yeah, use simpler words because this is not about your huge vocabulary or fancy turn of phrase. It is about your message and using fancy words gets in the way of people understanding your message. It's like you don't want to notice the writing. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? It does. Um, when somebody is trying to impress with their words, it is usually really irritating for the reader. Yawning hippopotami. It's, it's just dull and it makes you dislike the person who's doing it. Yeah. Will Self does this, actually. I... Will Self is a funny example because if you pick up a Will Self novel, you expect to have to sit there with a dictionary next to you. So it's kind of like, okay, so that's my expectation. But for most people, and it does drive me a little bit at the wall and then I instantly forget what the word meant anyway. So it's not like it's improving my vocabulary. I do think that Will Self's books are a little bit creative masturbation. 
I've got to be honest. I'm really sure Will Self does not give any cares to your opinion. Oh, I'm 100% sure. <laughs> and I also think that he would probably nod and be like, yeah, it is creative masturbation. Fuck you. Which is fair enough. And that's what he's going for. And that's why I've got his books on my shelf and do read them because mm-hmm. I pick them up with the expectation that I'll need to look up words. Okay. But for most of us, especially if you're writing a book to help people, um, a non-fiction book to help people, don't do that because they're going to get to the first, you know, the, the second or third word that they don't understand. They're just going to put your book down and do something else. So, um, or if you do use an unusual word, put a footnote in and explain it. Because that's, that's cool. I quite like, you know, I, I don't mind having to look at a footnote and think, oh, I've learned a new word. That's pretty cool. Okay. But yeah, don't, don't use pretentious words. Joe. Do you want to read the next one? <laughs> <laughs> You're right there, <clears throat> Yes. Uh, check all the chapter starts. Have you spent too much time clearing your throat? Uh, ditch it and get to the point. I've just realised that these are notes for me, not for you. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, <laughs> You're right, love. I just need to clear my throat. Then. Would, you, would you like some water? <laughs> okay. Um, so what Joe meant by that tip was, um, at the beginning of chapters or new sections... What we tend to do is warm up with our writing. And so we will spend a little bit of time clearing our throats and setting the scene and babbling. Faffing about. Faffing about. Like the first 20 minutes of this podcast usually is just kind of fluff before we get to the actual point of it. Yeah. I mean, some people like that. I don't know. It's like the olives before you get to the cake. Okay. Um, Yeah. So (laughs) have you spent too much time setting the scene or clearing your throat at the beginning of your chapter? The answer will almost certainly be yes. Um, and you can usually ditch a good portion of it. Um, currently going through a couple of manuscripts at the moment for clients and I've got my big red pen out and I'm like, we could ditch this because it, this, this next couple of paragraphs is a really good start. Mm-hmm. Um, and it doesn't mean that your writing is not good. It just means we don't need all the preamble. Well, that stuff can be used elsewhere if need be, you know. We've said it before, you know, if you've, if you've written loads of stuff and it's not the right place for it, you can always call yeah. it an article, make it an email, put it somewhere else. Well, even then, though, it's like, let's get to the point. Yeah. Get to the point. Get to the point fast. Um, okay, next one. Omit needless words. I like that tip because it is in itself. Omit needless words. Um, words like that and often up and down. So rather than... Uh, rather than um, How often are you saying up and down? Well, for example, if you were writing... (laughs) I I literally can't think of an example. (laughs) I swear swear Vicky fails to come up with any examples. Okay. She wound up the clock. She wound the clock. She sat down. She sat. She sat down on a chair. She sat on a chair. That kind of thing. Or even just she sat. So they are really crude examples, but they are examples of words that you don't need. Okay. Um, the word that is the most common one. And is you can you can get rid of the word that 90, 90% of the time. Sometimes it will make the sentence make no sense, which means that you need to put it back in. But do you want an example of a sentence? Yeah, that? go for it. He said that all of the things that were in the cupboard weren't very tasty. He said all the things in the cupboard weren't very tasty. Same sentence, it just the first one had two extraneous thats in it, and the second one flowed much better. There are occasions where you will have to put the word that back in, or it won't make sense. Go for it. No, I can't think of that. Um, Again, busy day. If I'd been more prepared, I would have had an example of that. Fine. And I could take that that out as well. Too many that's. Okay, doesn't sound like a real word anymore. Right. Um, Okay, next tip, Joe. Uh, Ditch the shoe leather. Uh, For example, they walked in through the open door and sat down in chairs. There's a lot of shoe leather in there. We don't need all that detail. They walked in and sat down. Okay. Reasonable. (laughs) Yeah. But what, what if you've just spent, like, the last six months sweating away, writing your 100,000 words... And now you're like, I've got this book. And you go through this process and suddenly you've got 30,000 words and you don't have a book anymore. Well, first of all, if your 100,000 words is filled with things like they walked in through the open door and sat down in chairs, your 30,000 word book is going to be infinitely better. (laughs) Second of all, 30,000 words is a book. Is it? Yeah, it's a a short book, but it's a book. 
Okay. The average non-fiction book is around 50 or 60,000 words, but that doesn't mean it has to be. My, like my mindles. My mindles are dinky. Mindle. Mindle. New word. New word. We'll come back to that, reader, listener. Okay. Cool. Phew. All right. Um, okay. So that's really, yeah, we, what we mean by shoe leather is needless and boring detail. We don't, we don't need it. We don't need to know everything. Just pick out, think of it as, um, this is one of my favorite ever tips. Think of it as what would a director film for the close up? That's the detail that's important. So if you are writing something and somebody was filming it, even if it's nonfiction, what would they zoom in on? What would be the important details there? It wouldn't be, you wouldn't be zooming in on the, each footstep across the carpeted floor to the door where they put the handle on the door handle and turn the, do you know what I mean? Sounds like a horror movie. It kind, of, it kind of does, yeah. <laughs> it kind of does. So yeah, think about what you would zoom in on. What's in the one-inch frame, as um, Anne Lamott puts it in Bird by Bird? What's in the one-inch frame? What's the really important stuff to focus on? Everything else is just shoe leather. Um, I can't remember who first said shoe leather. It certainly wasn't me. I'm not claiming to have invented that term. I just can't remember who said it. Okay. Uh, avoid subtle redundancies. Yeah. So things like, and this is this is probably more of a an example for fiction than non-fiction, but it still applies, and you can think of your own redundancies. So, um, if you're saying that she nodded her head, what else is she going to nod? Just she nodded is fine. He clapped his hands. What else is he going to clap? Mm-hmm. So just watch out for little things like that. Um, those two examples are probably, as I say, more fiction, but. It applies to non. Um, don't be an adjectival and adverbial maniac. Good writing is mostly strong nouns and verbs, not excessive adjectives. So use adjectives and adverbs really sparingly. I've just used an, an unnecessary adverb, really. So the word very and all of its cousins, like really and totally and all of that kind of thing, ditch them. They're, they're just they're just weak. They weaken a good word. So and especially don't use the words good or nice. Mm-hmm. Oh, they're just boring. Just weak. They're weak, yeah. So instead of saying that somebody was really angry, say they were furious or incandescent or something more interesting than just really angry. Because mm-hmm. that doesn't it's, it's flat. It doesn't conjure up anything. But if you say somebody was furious, then instantly I get the idea of kind of, you know, a red face and slightly shiny and slightly silly hair. Because it's, it's just because somebody is furious. It's more passionate. There's, there's feeling in it. Um, and related to that is show, don't tell. So, for example, I, I spent ages trying to come, come up with them, show, don't tell. I facepalmed violently because I was so frustrated and angry. If you just say I facepalmed hard, that kind of conveys the idea that I was frustrated and angry. I don't need to explain that. Mm-hmm. It's like I slammed a door because I was really angry. Just slam the door. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's not a great example, because like I said, I threw this together fairly quickly. <laughs> okay, cool. But don't over-explain. What's the next one? Um, specifics add truth. Use them. Yeah. So if you're thinking, if you're telling a story and you can use statistics and there's a very specific number. So if you know that you did something for a client that made them, you know, very specifically £23,462, Mm-hmm. Give that number. Don't say over twenty thousand pounds because that immediately has the ring of not untruth, but it just it's less believable. Yeah, it's less believable. Specifics details have the ring of truth to them. So the, so use it. it. Also adds a richness to what you're talking about as well. So and it's not just. So, but but I mean, it kind of sounds like there's a balance between like excessive detail, shoe leather, and getting the specifics in. And that's that's where a copy editor will really help you because they will be able to help you decide what's important and what isn't. Mm. And, you know, I've just... It, I, I've got a couple of really good examples in a manuscript that I'm editing now. Obviously, I can't share them because it's not my manuscript. But um, there, was, there was a story being told. There was a really good story. And there was an awful lot of technical detail in there about what was going on with, with the... <laughs> with, with the vehicle involved and all the rest of it and I've put a red pen through a big chunk of it because actually that was a lot of technical detail that I found it difficult to understand mm-hmm. um, as a person who wasn't involved in that industry and all the rest of it so it didn't need to be in there because the story had the same had much more of an impact in fact without all of that detail but I could tell that from the outside because I'm the reader and also I'm an editor you know this is what I do for a living the writer 
couldn't see it because they were very technical and they doing were a technical very technical thing. and doing a technical technical thing and to them it was part of the story it was an important part of the story it's actually it's not an important part of the story for most of us does that make sense mm-hmm. does that help yeah okay. cool so yeah so sometimes we don't know what's what details to include and what details not to include and that's where outside readers will really help you with that um Okay, and my final my final tip for editing is avoid distracting mannerisms in your writing, punctuation, and typesetting. And what I mean by that is, and this is where I break one of my own rules, is like making up your own words. I do, I make up my own words sometimes, and I make no apologies for that. But they're not words that... I tend to make up words that are quite onomatopoeic, or they will, you know, they will add something, and they're very me. Mm-hmm. Um... What I don't do is things like trying trying to add drama by using layout and type. Leave that for poetry, right? We're, we're talking about books here. So, for example, if you were going to say um, somebody, I don't know, somebody fell down, somebody fell down the stairs, and, and it was like, oh, dot dot dot, my dot dot dot, God dot dot dot, bold, he fell down the stairs in capital letters. You just you don't need to do that. It's distracting. It screams amateur, mm-hmm. um, and it just it just means that you haven't put enough you haven't put enough thought into thinking about what what it might look and feel like to fall down the stairs. And this is what we're talking about: show don't tell. Mm-hmm. That's that's telling. It's not just telling. It's screaming it in your face, and it's also distracting, like visually, because yeah, you're stumbling around and it's it's not flowing, is it? Exactly, exactly. So. Um, And then I don't think there's much to say really about proofreading because it's literally looking out for spelling and grammar and typos and things like that. Everybody knows what a proofreader is. It's difficult to proof your own work though, isn't it? Because you know what you meant to say when you said it. And it's it's really important. If you are going to try and proof your own work, you need to have a chunk of time between writing it and proofing it because you've got to forget what you meant to say at that point I yeah think. and there are loads of tips out there for proofing like some people say read it backwards I do not have the patience for that kind of nonsense um, but people do say read it backwards start from the end and, and you know read it read it paragraph by paragraph but from the back of the book right um, which can help you because you're not re- you're not you're mm-hmm. not reading it in such a way that it flows um, so there's that I don't have the patience for that kind of thing um, mm-hmm. I can't proof my own stuff there is some really good software out there Grammarly is good uh, Grammarly will help you. Pro Writing Aid is better. I've actually stopped using Grammarly now, and I now have changed to Pro Writing Aid because it's really it's it's just better. Mm-hmm. Um, but none of those things can beat the services of a really good proofreader. So if you invest in no other professionals, do you know what I thought about this? I thought if if I could only work with one professional, would it be a structural editor, a copy editor, or a proofreader, or a coach? And it very much depends on your level of writing skill, I think. So if you are if you are a really good writer, if you write for a living, you probably don't you probably wouldn't want to put your money in a copy editor because you will probably be able to do quite a good job of that yourself. Hmm. A structural editor might be a good investment, but again, if you do a lot of this, you'll probably be fine. And so I would say if, you know, if I don't know really, it's difficult. It's, it depends on like I've talked to people who have asked me to do editing for them, and I've been like, actually, I think I would do. A, I think you you would be better off because my editing fees are really really high. You would be better off hiring me as a coach and a structural, you know, to help you get the structure right, mm. rather than the copy editing side of things. And so it's it yeah, it, it depends where the where the skills lie really as to yeah where the best spend is. But if you have a, if you have a really really tight budget and you're like, oh, I really I really don't have a lot of money. I would say if you invest in nobody else, a proofreader is the most important. Hmm. Because a good proofreader often picks up stuff that copy editors will pick up as well. It's just that that's not, you can't expect them to. (laughs) So I hope that that is helpful and gives you a few good tips on how to copy edit your own book. Um, As I say, if you've got the, if you've got the budget, invest in a professional because they will take your manuscript from good to fantastic. Hmm a good copy editor will will do an amazing job. Um, but yeah, if, if nothing else, get a proofreader. Cool. Have you got anything to add, Joe, or any questions? I'm I'm just sitting here looking pretty, to be honest. Yeah, you are. You do look pretty. Thank you. Um, I, on the other hand, 
had to put a hat on because my, my hair was just misbehaving. My hair is kind of a bit ridiculous. I need a haircut. <laughs> it's got a bit fluffy. Um, right. Happy right. Halloween. Happy Halloween, everybody. Yeah. Is that too American? We're going to get British people being like, we don't say happy Halloween here. Yeah, and no trick-or-treating this year or anything. It's a little bit weird. Well, did we really do trick-or-treating anyway? I don't know. But I quite like giving sweets to children. That's what well dodgy. <laughs> Halloween, obviously. Mm, okay. Right, we've got a review to read. Yes, you do have a review to read. Because we need to get out of here. We do, we need dinner. Okay. Um, five out of five stars, Ray K. Ray Khan. Ray Khan, hi yeah, Ray. Hi Ray. Yeah. How are you doing, Ray? Um, just brilliant. Vicky and her hubby Joe, that's me, are just over the top. Best part is Vicky knows what the heck she's talking about when it comes to business marketing. In between the chuckles and sips of gin, oh, we need to drink more gin. You will learn some very valuable business marketing lessons and you cannot help but drink to that. So this was Ray. Thank you, Ray, for Thanks, that Ray. lovely review. Um, Ray wrote that quite a long time ago before I specialised in books and book writing. So, but, you know, if you're writing a book, you need to know how to market the damn thing. And that is one of the things that... We will talk about. Yeah, you're on video. Sorry. <laughs> also on audio. <laughs> That was Joe too, yeah, like a massive yawn. I got up at like four o'clock this morning or something. You did not. You so got up early. at ten to six at the same time so as me. So early. Um, right, next week we are going to be talking about the three big reasons people want to write a book and what to do about it. Okay. Yeah, it's going Lovely. to be a good one. I know. So what, we, what do we want people to do this week? I would like people to read my new, to buy and read my new Mindle. Mindle, that's a word. Mini Kindle. Mini book. Okay, mini book. Yeah, my mini book. I have I have written it. I wrote it um, a month or so ago. I have finally finished it. The cover is all done. I'm still wrestling the cover for the print version onto Amazon because Amazon. Um, but yes, you can get the Kindle version for the teeny tiny sum of three ninety nine. Okay, nice. I know, right? Um, and it's called Banish the Blank Page of Doom. Banish the Blank Page of Doom fast. I didn't put the right type on. It. <laughs> Banish the blank page of doom fast. You can find it on Amazon and there will be a link in the show notes and I would love it if you would go and grab a copy. Um, I would also love it even more if you would leave me a review, pretty please. Thank please you. leave us a review because, um, well, leave me a review, it's my book. Helps um, marvellously. Yes, it really does help. And if you are in any doubt, I had a really lovely Facebook message from um, an old acquaintance who who bought my Mindle and read it, got halfway through and was like, I really think this this would help my son who really struggles with self-belief and starting things because he's terrified that they're going to be rubbish. And, um, you know, he had his confidence really knocked out of him at primary school, which makes me so sad. Hmm. And that just, that made me cry, happy tears. And just, yeah, so I, I took the swears out and then sent him... Sent him a de-sweared version. Sent him a de-sweared version um, for his son. And I really hope it makes a difference. And so, you know, that's somebody who found my little mini book useful enough to want to give to his kids. And so I feel like that's a pretty good endorsement. That's a pretty strong endorsement. Yeah. So maybe have a read. And if you would like a clean version for your kids, drop me an email and I will absolutely send you one. Cool. Yeah. You can also... And that also, by the way, is a reason for you to write your own book because someone somewhere will be grateful that you did. Mm. Write your book. And if you'd like to do that, you can join my live writing sessions at moxiebooks.co.uk forward slash power hour. Nice. We would love to have you. Um, if you've listened to every episode, please email me with your postal address and I will send you a special silly gift. If you liked this podcast, please go and subscribe and leave us a review and a rating. Five stars. Five stars. If you didn't enjoy it, other podcasts are available. Um... We should do we should do a our favourite podcasts podcast at some point, shouldn't we? We should, yes. Let's do that, because that also won't require an awful lot of preparation. It won't. <laughs> and we can just natter about why we love them. We should do that. Good plan. Okay, so we're gonna go now. Thanks so much for listening and watching, if you have been watching. Um thanks for doing that too. And um I'm really hungry. Really hungry. Yeah, let's eat. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening. You can find links and show notes on the website at moxiebooks.co.uk forward slash podcast, where you can also sign up for the best daily emails in the multiverse and find loads of free resources to help you write your book. 
We'll be back the same time next week with more tales from the book writing trenches and the latest on what the tiny sheeps have been up to. Thank you.